Income tax 2023-2024. Maker's depreciation. Which recovery period applies? Get ready and some coffee so we can do some tax interpretation with income tax preparation 2023-2024. Most of this information can be found in publication 946, How to Depreciate Property, Section 179, Deduction, Special Depreciation Allowance, Makers, Listed Property, and more, Tax Year 2023, which you can find on the IRS website at irs.gov, irs.gov. Remember, first, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our, trust me, I'm an accountant product line. Yeah, it's paramount that you let people know that you're an accountant. Because apparently we're among the only ones equipped with the number crunching skills to answer society's current deep, complex, and nuanced questions. If you would like a commercial-free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. We're in the first half of the income tax formula, basically a funny income statement. Most income statements having income minus expenses resulting in net income. Here, having income minus various deductions resulting in taxable income. The sole proprietorship schedule C rolling into line one income of the formula. Remembering the Schedule C itself, basically an income statement, having business income minus business expenses, which you could call business deductions, resulting in net business income, which rolls in from Schedule C to line one of the income tax formula. The formula supporting the calculation behind the Form 1040, page one of which we see here, Schedule C ultimately rolling into line eight, additional income from Schedule 1. This is the Schedule 1, additional income and adjustments, part 1, additional income, Schedule C rolling into line 3, business income or loss, Schedule C. This is the Schedule C, profit or loss from business, having an income statement format, income minus expenses, expenses, what we're focused on at this point in time, expenses having the most different categories within it typically, some expenses mean more difficult than others, such as depreciation, because as we've seen in prior presentations, even if we're on a cash-based system, the accounting system, the tax code, will also for often force us to still do an accrual thing, such as when we purchase property, plant, and equipment, not allowing us to expense it as just equipment expense, but put it on the books as an asset, which there is no balance sheet, so therefore we could add depreciation schedules to do so, tracking the asset account, the balance sheet account of equipment, and accumulated depreciation, and then calculating the expense to be recorded in our expenses, this time in the form of depreciation expense. Also noting, when we think of depreciation, we can think of it in alignment with generally accepted accounting principles, which is the maker's component typically of the depreciation. That's kind of like the foundation that actually has a solid grounding in theory because they took that from generally accepted accounting principles, basically. Then we have other things that are accelerated depreciation, such as the 179 and special depreciations we talked about before. Those things are most likely to fluctuate greatly from year to year as the politics change, as the lobbyists do their lobbying, as the, you know, as the things go on, right? So which recovery period applies? So now we're talking recovery periods. We're looking at the heart of depreciation, which is the maker's depreciation uh, generally, and looking at the recovery periods, noting that when we have the equipment, if you purchased 100,000 piece of equipment, we can think about whether we get 179 or the special depreciation, but keeping those aside, the general accounting of the general concept of depreciation is we put it on the books as an asset and decide how long it's going to have a life from that we're going to recover the benefit kind of like again if we think about it as the potential energy the potential deduction in the basis when do we get the benefit from it 
how many years over. We're not going to get the benefit evenly because the energy, the deduction is going to be higher usually given the uh, double declining method that we're going to be using. All right. So the recovery period of property is the number of years over which you recover its costs or other basis. So you see this forklift, it's on the books, it's got the potential energy in the basis. I'm really stuck on this energy thing right now. I've been watching my energy courses, but it's, and then it's gonna be consumed over the number of years uh, to help us uh, with the deduction. So it is determined based on the depreciation system, the GDS or the ADS. So the one that's most common for most businesses and most types of property is uh, the GDS. It's usually kind of like just the default that really pops into most people's mind generally. But we'll, we'll talk more about those in detail here. Recovery periods under GDS. Under GDS, property is depreciated over one of the following recovery periods. So we have the property class. Now, this is going to give us uh, the class of property and then the recovery periods. You'll note that within the class of property, one of the kind of the intuitive things that they did that makes sense is they is they called the property class by the number of years that you're going to recover it over. So obviously, three year property has a recovery period of three years. But it wasn't always the case that they didn't used to always like call the class of the property three year property. In other words, name the number of years it's going to be recovered over. So when you think about the tax code, these two things are different. You could you can imagine it's named like just, you know, equipment or something. And then it has a recovery period of three years. And then they got smart and said, we'll just call it three year property. Now, then, of course, the question is when we start in practice, what type of property is the thing that I bought falling in under? Because this will be important when we actually do the calculations within like software. If I bought a piece of property, I have to determine, do I get to expense it as supplies or maintenance? Or do I have to put it on the books as an asset? If I put it on the books as an asset, then I have to determine whether I'm using makers or acers. Usually it's going to be makers. And then I have to determine the property class and then once I assign the property class, the software will typically do the calculation based on the recovery period of three years and whatever method being used, usually double declining and convention, usually a half year convention, which we will talk about later. So once we determine these classes, the, the next question is, well, what kind of we've talked about what kind of property fits into those classes and the tax code is trying to be very strict so that so that you can't just pick and choose which class or how long you're going to depreciate things because again from a taxpayer standpoint our incentive is to, to try to choose the least amount of years to depreciate over so that i can get more of the potential energy sooner rather than later more of the deduction all right so then we have five-year property which is obviously over a recovery period of five years and then we've got the seven-year property and you guessed it seven years is the recovery period 10-year property, can you guess what the recovery period will be? 10 years. And so 15-year property, 15 years. Now, remember that the 3, the 5, the 10, and then to some, I mean, the 3, the 5, the 7, and then to some extent, the 10 are usually the recovery periods most seen by uh, small to mid-size companies. So most of the times when you buy property and equipment for a sole proprietorship schedule C, your question is it is it three, five, or seven years is is typically often the case. Uh, but in any case, we got the 15 year properties over 15 years. We discussed what falls into those categories a bit prior. Uh, 20 year property, 20 years, 25 year property, 25 years. And then we bounce back to not saying the number of years, but we just call it residential rental property and it's 27.5 years. Now, notice the massive differences between like residential rental property, for example, and, you know, five year property like machinery or something like that. That's when you get into these questions of, well, if I bought a residential rental property, do I have to just depreciate the entire thing over 27.5 years or can I break that property out into the components that I actually purchased? All the things within the property 
that maybe I can I can report separately. So if I paid a hundred thousand for property instead of depreciating a hundred thousand over twenty seven point five years, is it possible to say I only depreciate seventy five thousand over the twenty seven point five years, and then I allocate the other stuff to five year, seven year, three year, ten year property because it's air conditioning or something like that. It's parts of the building. And the question is, if it's not attached to the building or whatever and so on, maybe I could depreciate it over shorter periods. You can see how that gets quite complex. And there's, again, businesses and firms that that's basically all they do sometimes is, is try to figure out how they can come up with smaller depreciation periods for large purchases like buildings. And then non-residential real property, so obviously residential, usually you're thinking of property that people are going to live in like homes, possibly apartments, and then non-residential, you're thinking like office buildings and so on. And that one even has a longer 39 years, right? So if you have 39 years, that's a long time to have to depreciate something over. And when you buy the, the property, you also have to break out the land versus the building. And then on the building side, you have to depreciate over that long period, which again, you might try to break out and see if there's anything in that that you can allocate not to building, but possibly to some kind of equipment or something like that. All right, property class recovery. Here's just a summary of what we looked at. And just to note that we have these little this little one here, five years for qualified rent to own property placed in service before August. And this little two here for the 15 year, 39 year for property that is retail motor fuel and so on. So you have these kind of exceptions I just wanna put in the slide. Uh, if you want to take a look at those in more detail. So the GDS recovery periods for the property not listed above can be found in Appendix B, Table of Class Lives and Recovery Periods. The residual rental property and non-residential pro uh, real property are defined earlier under which property class applies under GDS. So enter the appropriate recovery period on Form 4562. Obviously, software will help us to pick the proper thing that we're going to use to depreciate the recovery period and so on and then in in practice typically and then that'll populate of course form form 562 under column d in section b of part three <laughs> that whole thing rhymes that's funny unless already shown for 25 year property residential rental property and non-residential real property all right office in the home so this is common for many small businesses you got the home office if you have a home office and you rent, then the rent, part of the rent that you pay, which usually would be personal, might be deductible as a business expense. But if you own the home, then you're not paying rent because you bought the home and therefore part of the purchase price might be deductible in the form of depreciation, which can get a little bit messy for small businesses because then you have to deal with this depreciation of part of the home, which is partially personal and so on and so forth. So if your home is a personal use single family residence and you begin to use part of your home as an office, depreciate that part of your home as non-residential real property over 39 years, because even though it's your home, you're using it as non-residential like business property. 31.5 years if you begin using it for business before May 13th, 1993. So however, if your home is an apartment in apartment building that you own and the building is residential rental property as defined earlier under which property class applies under GDS, depreciate the part used as an office as residential rental property over 27.5 years. So again, substantial difference if we have to record it over as non-residential versus a uh, residential property. And we can see publication 587 for discussion of the tests you must meet to claim expenses, including depreciation for the business use of your home. Now, the other thing that comes into play with the business use of the home is of course, what should the basis be? So you wanna keep keep that in mind. You have to, might, we're concentrated on depreciation right now. But if you transferred the home and you didn't just purchase the home, then then of course you have a question of, well, what should be the, 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 the basis of the home that I'm gonna allocate the percent to for the office portion of the home since I didn't you know just purchase it. So in any case, just keep that in the back of your mind if you're 
get into these home office deduction. Home changed to rental use. So if you begin to rent a home that was your personal home before 1987, you depreciate it as residential rental property over 27.5 years. Uh, recovery periods under ADS. So this is the other one. We had GDS, now we're on ADS. The recovery periods for most property are generally longer under ADS than they are under GDS. And that is why we don't usually use ADS unless we are forced to because we don't elect to use the shorter or the ADS because it has longer recovery periods. And our general rule is that if we have this potential energy, we have this depreciable property, this basis, I would like to get access to it, use it up sooner rather than later. And therefore, the shorter recovery periods of the GDS are usually preferable to the longer uh, periods of the ADS. So the following table are showing some of the ADS recovery periods. So these are kind of less common, so I'll go over them more quickly. So notice the property here, not showing the, the years in the property. That's why uh, the ADS, I believe, is older. So this is how it used to be. You had to determine the property and then look at the table for the recovery period. But with the new, uh, with the new recovery period uh, system under the GDS, they actually tell you the recovery period in the property uh, for the most part, making it a little bit easier. But rent to own property, uh, four years, automobiles and light duty trucks, five years, uh, computers and peripheral equipment, five years, high technology telephone station equipment, five years, high uh, technology medical equipment, five years, personal property, uh, 12 years, we've got the natural gas gathering lines, 14 years, single purpose agricultural and heterocultural structures, 15 years, any tree or vine bearing fruits or nuts, 20 years, and continuing on, initial clearing and grading land improvements for gas utility, 20 years, initial clearing and grading land improvements and so on, 25 years, electronic transmission property used in the transmission at 69 or more, so on, quite specific, 30 years, natural gas distribution lines, 35 years, non-residential real property, 40 years, so residential rental property, 30 years, section 1245 real property not listed in appendix B, 40 years, railroad grading and tunnel, uh, that's going to be the 50-year property. Additions and improvements. In addition or improvement or an addition or improvement you make to depreciable property is treated as separate depreciable property. So in other words, let's say we have the property. Let's say it's like, it's like real estate, uh, some form of real estate property. It's on the books as an asset. We're depreciating it. Well, what if I make a repair to it? Well, first, the question is, if I do something to it, is it repairs or is it an improvement? If I just fix a portion of the roof, it's going to be maintenance that I can expense. That would be the easy thing to do. What if it has to be classified as an improvement, like possibly we redid the entire roof? Then the question is, well, do I have to include it in the basis of the actual building itself? And the answer is usually no we're going to record it separately as an, an improvement on, on the books. So now we have the building and we have a new roof that we, we're lining up in the depreciation schedule. They're connected, but they're recorded separately, right? Okay. See how to treat repairs and improvements in chapter one for, de for definition of improvements. It's property class and recovery period are the same as those that would apply to the original property if you had placed it in service at the same time you placed the addition or improvement in service. So in other words, then the question is, well, how long should I depreciate this over? And, the, and that, that's going to be the property class. So we're going to assign the property class, which will give us how long we depreciate it over. And again, it's property class and recovery period are the same as those that would apply to the original property if you had placed it in service at the same time you placed the addition or improvement in service. The recovery period begins on the later of the following. 
the date you place the addition or improvement in service, the date you place in service the property to which you made the addition or improvement. Example, so you own a rental home that you have been renting out since 1981. If you put an addition on the home and place the addition in service this year, you would use makers to figure your depreciation deduction for the addition. Under GDS, the property class for the addition is residential rental property and its recovery period is 27.5 years because the home to which the addition is made would be residential rental property if you had placed it in service this year. So in other words, you had this rental property, it was rented in 1981, which means the recovery periods or the depreciation that you might use might have been different back in 1981 but you did the improvements this year and you're going to be using the the recovery period that would apply to the entire purchase of the residential rental property as though you you, you made the purchase this year and therefore you're depreciating the improvement not on, not over the method that might have been used back in 1981 when you purchase the property, which would match possibly the depreciation method being used on the property itself, but rather the current depreciation period. That's my uh, interpretation of it.